Hello everyone, my name is Travis and welcome to my channel that covers different Azure related topics. I'm a Microsoft Certified Trainer, Microsoft MVP, and have over 20 years experience in IT. You can find me at my website or on Twitter. In this video, we go over core resources available in Azure. We cover topics required to pass the AZ900 Azure Fundamentals exam, but this information is beneficial to anyone new to Azure. Let's quickly go over what this section is about. It's common for Microsoft certification exams to give you a scenario or a problem statement, then provide multiple options to address the problem or scenario. To answer the question correctly, you need to know what those options are and some level of detail on how they work. This is a fundamental exam, so you're not expected to know every aspect of how to deploy and manage specific Azure resources, but you will need to understand what the resources are and what distinguishes them from similar resources. Coming up, we start by reviewing the core resources you should expect to see on the exam. This video covers compute and networking resources in Azure. Before we get started, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and share with a friend. Check out my courses available on udemy.com. The link is below. Also, the slides used in this presentation are located at my blog. The link for that is also below. Let's jump into Azure Core Resources. We'll break this down into categories that follow the published requirements. The first items fall under compute, starting with virtual machines. A virtual machine is an instance of a Windows or Linux computer running in Azure. This is comparable to virtual servers you may have on premises, with some notable differences. They can be deployed on demand, meaning we can spin up new instances without worrying about the capacity of the underlying physical hardware. We can scale the VMs up or down, meaning we increase or decrease the size of the VM or we can scale them out or back in, meaning we increase or decrease the number of instances of a VM. We only pay for VMs we use. We can deallocate the VM when not in use to stop charges. This is a great option for lab or seasonal workloads that don't need to be running 24 by seven. Notice deallocate will stop charges, not shut down. If we simply shut down the VM from inside the operating system, the virtual hardware is still allocated and we're still billed for it. Instead, we deallocate the VM from the portal. This frees up the resources and stops VM-related charges. Something else to know, a Windows VM is billed for the OS and the virtual hardware. That way, we're in compliance with licensing without committing to any long-term licensing contracts. And I should point out that you can use hybrid benefits to remove the OS cost, but that's outside of the scope of this discussion. Linux is open sourced and there are no OS costs when we deploy a Linux virtual machine. We only pay for the virtual hardware. Windows Server 2008 R2 and above are supported as Azure virtual machines, as well as Windows 7, Windows 10, and Windows 11 clients, including Windows 10 and Windows 11 multi-user, a version of the Windows client that can host multiple end-user connections. Most popular versions of Linux, including CentOS, Debian, Oracle Linux, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, SUSE, and Ubuntu. One interesting note about Linux in Azure, it's been reported that over 50% of the virtual machines running in Azure are running Linux, a somewhat surprising statistic for the Microsoft Cloud. Virtual machines are a common entry point for a lot of people getting started with the cloud. The concept is familiar and they're easy to deploy. Sometimes we'll need to create multiple copies of a VM for batch processing or to provide redundancy. A scale set gives us a way to manage multiple instances of a VM. It provides redundancy and performance for applications that can be distributed across multiple servers or scaled out. Scaling plans can be based on a schedule or based on resource utilization, such as the amount of CPU or RAM used. A scale set is accessible through an Azure load balancer or an application gateway. Both are options for network load balancing. Emulating a data center by standing up VMs in Azure is not always the most efficient option when moving to the cloud. For example, let's say we have a web application we want to deploy in Azure. We could stand up a VM with a web server and deploy the application. For high availability, we can add multiple instances of the server and the application. But now we have to manage patching and updates for the OS and the web server. We have to add or remove server instances as demands increase and decrease. All that is not an efficient way to spend our time. A better option is to use an Azure App Service. An App Service is an HTTP-based 
service used for hosting web apps. This is a platform as a service or PaaS offering that takes care of the underlying OS and web server, allowing us to focus on developing the application. It supports .NET, .NET Core, Java, Ruby, Node.js, PHP, or Python in Windows or Linux environments. App services support load balancing across regions or the globe and auto scaling to dynamically increase and decrease capacity based on load. Let's talk about containers next. Azure has a couple different options, and if you're unfamiliar with containers, it can be a little confusing. You probably understand the concept of virtualization, using a hypervisor on physical hardware to partition resources and create independent virtual computers. This has been such a good way to reduce the data center footprint and better utilize resources that it's the standard for modern data centers. Containers take this even further by creating a package that contains the application and all its dependencies. These containers are portable, meaning that they can be moved to different environments, making application development easier. They're lightweight, they only contain the code needed to run, and are isolated and share the underlying OS, not requiring one OS per application. They also start quickly because they don't depend on the underlying OS to start. This makes them a great solution for rapidly scaling out applications. Containers are also stateless. That means there are no record of changes while the container runs. Basically, if we restart or destroy and recreate a container, it will be the same each time it starts up. If we need to modify a container, we have to update the source container image. Azure Container Instance is an Azure service that allows us to run an isolated instance of a container. We could leverage Azure Container Instance or ACI to run a simple application or an automation process. ACI supports both Linux and Windows containers. ACI provides the ability to mount persistent storage from Azure files. Previously, we stated that a container is stateless. We can leverage persistent storage to capture log settings and other data that needs to persist between running of a container instance. We can also leverage a virtual network so other resources in Azure can interact with a container. A container instance gives us a place to run a single instance of a container image, but where do we store and retrieve these images? Docker is a popular format for container images. Docker offers a set of products to create, manage, and run containers. The Azure Container Registry is a managed and private registry service. It's kind of like a library for container images. It's based on the open source Docker registry standard. There are three tiers to Azure Container Registry, basic, standard, and premium. All three support the same set of features. Standard supports more storage and throughput for delivering containers than basic does. And premium offers more storage and throughput than standard, as well as geo-replication of images. We can also secure access to the registry with Azure Active Directory identities. Let's go back to the example of containers running on a VM. Let's say we need to scale out the application so we add additional instances. We need the applications running on these containers to talk to each other, so we add networking. Having all this run on one server introduces a single point of failure, so next we need to duplicate the environment to a second server. Those need to be networked as well. Now let's say we get an unexpected spike in usage, so we have to add more instances. Next, a container runs into some issue, so we have to remove and redeploy it. And the spike is over, now we can remove some of the containers. The point here is the simple container idea is getting more complicated. Add in load balancers, firewalls, and multi-tiered application, and the effort to manage the environment becomes significant. That's what Azure Kubernetes Service, or AKS, is for. AKS is a hosted Kubernetes service used to deploy and manage clusters. Kubernetes is a container orchestration service. It scales services up or down based on rules. It can handle upgrading to a new version of a container image. Kubernetes can manage access to persistent storage, as well as networking and inbound traffic load balancing. All three of these, Azure Container Instance, Azure Container Registry, and Azure Kubernetes Service, provides a complete set of tools for deploying and managing containerized services. The last item under Azure Compute is Azure Virtual Desktop. Azure Virtual Desktop provides the ability to deploy and manage client desktops in Azure. It supports Windows 10 and Windows 11, including a new multi-user version 
of the Windows client only available in Azure. With Windows 10 or Windows 11 multi-user, multiple users can log in and share an instance of a client running on an Azure VM. Azure Virtual Desktop also supports Windows Server OS if that's required. Azure Virtual Desktop includes connection management, the publicly available gateway used to connect to the service. FSLogic's profile management provides a way to centralize a user's profile so it's portable, moving with them as they log into different computers in an Azure Virtual Desktop environment. Also, MSIX AppAttach provides a way to attach applications to an OS instead of installing them on the OS, making the applications portable. Azure Virtual Desktop is a full-featured VDI solution hosted in Azure. Let's move on to networking next. Just like how a network on-premises is used to connect servers and appliances together, a virtual network represents connectivity between resources in Azure. An Azure Virtual Network, or VNet, is a building block to connect resources in Azure over a private network. It supports IPv4 and IPv6, as well as providing internet connectivity. We can isolate resources on their own VNet. We can create routing rules on a VNet with custom-defined route tables, or use Border Gateway Protocol, a dynamic routing protocol, with Azure Gateways or ExpressRoute. Virtual networks also provide traffic filtering based off source and destination IP address, port, and protocols with network security groups. Azure Virtual Networks are deployed to a region. But what if resources in two different regions and networks need to communicate? We can apply VNet peering to connect these two VNets. VNet peering creates a private link between multiple VNets. We can extend our VNet to connect to our on-premises network with a VPN gateway. Used with equipment at the customer's location, a VPN establishes a secure tunnel that passes traffic over the public internet. A VPN gateway enables connectivity for point-to-site connections, where a single endpoint connects to a VPN, such as a remote user, or site-to-site, -site, connecting separate networks, such as an on-premises network and a VNet, like we saw on the last slide. We can also connect VNets to each other. We have similar functionality with VNet peering, but if the needs require it, we can connect VNets with a VPN connection. There are two generations of VPN gateways available, with multiple SKUs available for each. The basic SKU is only recommended for testing, labs, and proof of concept. It's not recommended for production environments. Any SKU with the AZ designation supports deploying gateways in an availability zone for high availability. VPN connectivity will work well for many organizations, but has some shortcomings. It uses encryption to securely route traffic over the public internet. There is no way to control latency and prioritize traffic with quality of service. For that, we need ExpressRoute. ExpressRoute connects on-premises networks to the Microsoft Cloud over a private connection. ExpressRoute is reliable because it uses dedicated lines. It also provides dedicated bandwidth and lower, more consistent latency. ExpressRoute connects an on-premises edge over dedicated redundant connections to the Microsoft Edge. Once attached to the Microsoft network, we can access Microsoft 365 resources, such as Office, SQL, and Azure AD. We can also connect to our private VNets deployed to an Azure subscription. Azure ExpressRoute uses Layer 3 connectivity and BGP to route traffic over the connection. Microsoft requires two circuits for each ExpressRoute connection. This provides high availability in the event of a single circuit failure. ExpressRoute can connect on-premises resources with Microsoft services such as Office 365 and Dynamics, and Azure compute services such as virtual machines and scale sets, as well as other PaaS services like Azure SQL and Storage. Although it can be used to access Office 365, Office 365 was designed to be secure and reliable over the internet. In most scenarios, it's better not to use Office 365 with ExpressRoute. That wraps it up for this video, where we went over core resources in Azure, including compute and networking. Thank you for joining me. I hope this helps you study for the AZ900 Azure Fundamentals exam. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and thanks for watching.